top shelf, old boy. Old boy. Yeah, it's it's what I want in a Spider-Man movie, but I, I didn't necessarily know what I wanted until I saw it. Lamb drops. And everyone's like, <laughs> but blow, baby, come on, <laughs> live a little. Just try some yaki soap. <laughs> Broadcasting live from inside the power band, this is The Blah. In this episode, everybody dies. I'm your host, the Wolverine, along with my dear friends. There he goes. Here I go. <laughs> and C Lab Forever, aka Algorithm. Hey guys. This week on the Blah, folks, we're going to be talking about two Spider Man films. We wanted to talk about the new MCU film, Spider Man Far From Home, but we all found that. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse was a much more interesting film, so we're going to be talking about that, and we're going to be talking about Far From Home a little bit. Let's kick it off. Kick it! (laughs) Fuck yeah. There he goes. (laughs) Start talking now. (laughs) Yeah, I mean... um. Spider-Man Far From Home. It's the last movie in Phase 3, I believe, of the MCU and kind of brings everything to a close. It was interesting. It was quite vanilla in terms of Spider-Man stuff. Um, It had its uh, moments. I really do like the new Spider-Man, Tom Holland or whatever, but uh, yeah, just kind of plain Jane, I guess. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, have you guys noticed something? Are the aren't the Marvel movies starting to feel like episodes in a larger arcing TV show to you? Yeah, and like some of them are like you know they're great and they're entertaining, but they seem like they're sort of like filler episodes. Yes. Yeah. We talked a little bit on in some earlier episodes about like comic relief and how some directors or filmmakers use the breaking of the tension with some comedy to kind of like prevent people from getting anxiety attacks throughout. And it feels like, you know, some of these movies are more playful and they're meant to be a little bit less serious and that's great and everything, but like it does make it much less memorable and makes it a lot more just kind of a whatever experience. Is that kind of what you were getting at, Benny? Yeah. I mean, it's a certain, I don't know. I mean, certain movies really stick out to me and I think they're really interesting and they're, you know, they do some great stuff, uh, whether it be with the humor or the effect or the visual effects or, you know, just, uh, or or just how they put the movie together. But, um, this one, I mean, let me preface this. Like I liked the movie. Yeah. I liked it just fine. Um, I didn't think it was bad at all. There were, and there were a lot of little aspects of it that I thought were great, but, um, you know, at the end of it, I was like, eh, okay, well, this is clearly just leading up to something else, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I totally agree. This movie is great. Okay, Far From Home is great. Good enough anyways. It's not a vanilla film. It's just it's really what you guys were talking about a few episodes back. It's about uh I I think you called it hero fatigue or superhero fatigue like I mean we're on like movie 23 of the MCU plus all the DCU movies plus everything else. It's like, it's like, it's just leading up to something else like Ben said. And it's, you know, it's another cog in the wheel, so to speak. And, you know, after a while you're going to get sort of um, desensitized to pretty much anything you watch. And I think that's happening in particular with star Wars films and with superhero films. And, You know, it's like you see something new. Like, I mean, people from our generation, like we've been dying to see superheroes on the big screen um, with a really excellent level of portrayal um, with the effects, the graphics, the costumes, the acting, the whole Miguel Amanda. Now we've got like A-list actors playing all these superheroes. The, The scripts are great. The movies are fantastic. But after a while, you're gonna get not tired of it, but you're going to get desensitized to it. Or like the, 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 um, the honeymoon is going to be over, you know? So it's like after 23 films and I'm just talking about Marvel there, you know, it's like, okay, (laughs) you know, like great. Another great, great film. Like they're all really great. You know, um, this one 
had a lot of great elements going on um, that I'd be happy to talk about after my opening tirade. But um, <laughs> I think that's what's really going on here. Like, there's nothing wrong with the film. It's just that, you know, we've seen a ton of superhero movies and it's, you know, the honeymoon's over, man. We're just like, yeah, okay. You know, so like when you put it up against Spider-Verse, which is, you know, technically related uh, according to Sony anyway, um, it's it's just, it's so good. <laughs> it's such eye candy. And for a guy that started out watching Spider-Man on TV as a cartoon, like, it's so cool to watch the evolution too into the Spider-Verse, you know, and add in all these great spider characters like Spider-Man Noir, who's just awesome. So yeah, I knew, I knew you were going to love him. Yeah, totally, man. <laughs> you know me too well, Jared Hugo. I don't know where I read it or heard it, but someone was talking about how the superhero thing reminded them of the old school Western fad, you know, like Westerns were a huge thing forever. And then they just kind of exactly. petered out because of the f- potential for fatigue, maybe, or other reasons. I don't know. And it just seems to have that similar kind of feel where there's just so oversaturating us with the stuff, but they're still making billion dollars on each movie. So I don't know. I don't well, know. yeah, but Chad, I mean, that's exactly what I was. That's why I, I, I said Star Wars and Spider-Man, because it's like we've been yearning for Star Wars films since the, the prequel movies came out. And it's like, OK, now we have them. And it's like, OK, I think everybody's like, all right, you know, <laughs> you know, the first one came out in 78 and now we're here in 2019 and there's a bunch of them. If there was one every like three or five years instead of every year, it'd be better, you know? Even the Marvel movies, it was like every couple of years. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. So I think it's just fatigue. I mean, you know, we had a, you know, an episode entitled Star Wars Must Die. <laughs> I mean, yeah, come yeah. on, man. <laughs> yeah. So so I, I think it's just fatigue of these IPs, you know? It's like, how, how long can you, you know, how long can this possibly go on <laughs> until people start hating superheroes, you know? And Star Wars. Yeah. We'll get there eventually. Uh, one more thing I was going to add on the fatigue uh, thread is that there's been more Spider-Man movies than than any of the other characters. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, Spider-Man's gone through multiple, multiple incarnations. And uh, so, you know, I mean, mercifully, they, they skipped the origin story on, on this particular uh, MCU version with Tom Holland. But... Um, Thank God. You know, it's it's there in the background, I think, of your head when you're watching these movies. You're like, okay, it's, yeah, there's Spidey. Yep, he's swinging on the webs. And, you know, and this has come from somebody who, like, Spider-Man is pretty much my favorite. Like, I love Spider-Man. He's, I think he's great. Um, I, I identify with Peter Parker and, you know, I, I just like, I've always liked the character. So. Interesting. Because I identify with Peter Porker. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> Do you... Do you float through the air when you smell a pie, Kev? I do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I carry a large wooden hammer in my pocket as well. One of my favorite things about Peter Porker was his nostrils flaring like the eyes yes. on the suit. That was so fantastic. Yes. On on Spider-Verse, like I think even if you were to like strip back Spider-Verse to its mechanics and like remove the eye candy and remove like just having like the two scripts next to each other and and treating them, you know, on equal footing, like the the mechanics of Spider Verse are similar to the mechanics of any other, you know, superhero movie. Like, okay, multiverse, okay, Kingpin and Doc Ock, and they shift around who's cast as who and and whatever. But like, mm-hmm. the way it was handled was just clearly exceptionally better. You know, like the way that they chose to execute it and the 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 choices in the animation and and stuff it just it elevated the material i thought to an amazing degree i i agree because i i do think that the story you know i mean look again with fatigue like we've seen these types of stories before and we've read the comics so you know the story for spider verse is not like incredibly incredible you know it's it's you know, this villain is trying to create some ultimate device to do some sort of ultimate thing that, you know, at its base is done out of love. And, you know, Spider-Man's got to stop him. The teenage hero doesn't get along with his parents, gets a mentor. Yes, exactly. So it's not nothing like groundbreakingly new. 
earth shatteringly new, spider shatteringly new. But um, I agree. I think that you're, I think you're right is that the presentation was top shelf, old boy. Old boy. Yeah. It's, it's what I want in a Spider Man movie, but I, I didn't necessarily know what I wanted until I saw it, you know? And I think that's, I think that's kind of how it is at this point, you know? Like we're, we're kind of getting bored with these things and every once in a, in a while somebody does something surprising and, and different and fun and you're like, ah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. You know? Well, I think we touched on it. We touched on, um, I think maybe in Endgame, when we, t- we talked about that during the Endgame episode, we touched upon how we want to see the studios using other mediums like television shows or and you know now it's clearly obvious to do some animation stuff and i think even in the star wars episode benny you were saying how you wanted some of the clone wars stuff to be made canon and why couldn't one of the episodes be that you know like oh my god yes i think there's such an opportunity for these various franchises to use multimedia to get the story across it doesn't just need to be blockbusters sure well, I think this you could I, I think you can com, kind of compare Spider-Verse to Clone Wars. Like Clone Wars is like cult popular, you know. It's so good. And you know, Spider-Verse has that kind of same vibe to it, man. It's just like it's cool, it's well written, you know. It's 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 cool like that. Yeah. I think it'd be worth uh putting a pin in the whole massive conversation because it's a lot of of things to talk about and maybe just circling back real quick to rattle off a few of the likes on far from home i had a peter tingle you were gonna do that a peter tingle that was funny shit man <laughs> <laughs> i like the peter tingle thing nice call jarhigo hey jarhigo i had a peter tingle that you were gonna talk about that peter tingle that chad just had <laughs> <laughs> That's how quantum the show is. We we are in the Spider Verse now. There's some tingling going on uh, again. Yeah, we're you're you're like me too. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do this one more time. Okay. Um. All right. So I like the way that it tied the Phase Three stuff up in a little bit of a bow. You know, like Endgame and and uh, uh, what what the fuck was it? Infinity War. Infinity War and Endgame were really heavy duty balls to the wall, tons of ups and downs and heavy stuff. And then I think choosing to have like a lighthearted, more traditional, fun, silly, kind of weird, um, kind of weird comic book movie tie up the phase made a lot of sense. And it gave them a chance to do things like happy getting, you know, starting to date uh, Aunt May and like, you know, Peter getting all bent out of shape and kind of PTSD about the events of Endgame and even like even the opening scene where the like school kids making a really weird video where they're selfishly talking about having to take midterms and stuff like I thought it was it was cleverly handled and so I think you know choosing to have it close out the uh that particular arc I thought was interesting and it gave room to breathe and it also kind of gave an opportunity to reset everyone's emotional you know commitment to the the mcu because it was such a crazy ride with uh, infinity war and endgame and then once that's set up it kind of rattles through a bunch of normal stuff and there's some fun stuff and some kind of like why the hell did you do that stuff so i like the fact that peter sort of got inherited the keys to the kingdom yeah that was interesting from uh, mm. from tony stark you know like i, I kind of i like i liked that about it i think the thing i liked most about it was that he sort of inherited happy and you know it's yes. it's cool to know that like He's going to show up uh, in Spider-Man's movies now and, and, you know, in the in the MCU at large, like he's still going to be there, even though, you know, Iron Man's gone. I love that. I think that's great. On top of that, giving him an expanded role, Ben, totally. Yeah. I kind of like there was like that kind of Richie Rich vibe, you know, where like he's just the normal school kid. And then all of a sudden he's like on a jet flying over with like, you know, all of Tony's crazy bat toys and stuff. Gadgets. Yeah. Yeah, there's something cool about that. And like you, you get the impression that it's it's well deserved that he's going to like, you know, be responsible with it. So, so I like that aspect and, you know, like I, like I said, I love the character. I love I love uh, John Favreau is happy and I, I'm really glad he's still going to be a part of it. Uh, I was a little worried about that personally. <laughs> so, I'm glad he's still in there. And um yeah, I don't know. There's uh, just a lot of little I, the, something about the way the movie was structured was I had a hard time getting into it, you know, like I was like, just like, oh, here we go. All right. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a Spider-Man movie. Okay. And uh, something happened, you know, like I was like, okay, so Mysterio, all right, what, how's he, uh, how's he going to like show his true nature here? Like what's going to happen? And, and uh, the way that all of that unfolded, like it was kind of a long wind up in my opinion, but when the pitch was finally made, I was like, ah, all right, now I'm in, you know, like some, something about the way, something about the way it was structured really uh, like there's a point where it turned and like, I was really like in, suddenly engaged in the movie. So, um, and playing you know, on Peter's naivete was quite, I think, a, a, a solid component of that. Yes, yes, sure, yeah, I agree. Yeah, so yeah, um, I, I loved seeing uh, JB Smoove as one of the like chaperone teachers, even though like mm-hmm. he popped he popped up, and I was like, I was like, oh shit, JB Smoove, I love you. Is that Gilfoyle? Is that Gilfoyle? I don't remember what the characters. I don't remember what the characters. The, the name dude was. from Silicon Valley. Oh no no no! It wasn't Guilfoyle. It was the other teacher. It was the science teacher. It was the dude that was like, as a man of science, I'm going to say this is witches. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's witches. Who is he? I've never seen him before. What was he in? He's a comedian, but um, he, he's great. But uh, I I was introduced to him in uh, uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh okay. As uh, as yeah, he's 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 great in that and. Uh, you know, he didn't quite get as much screen time as I was hoping uh, when he first popped up, but nevertheless, I'm glad he was in it. Yeah, yeah. Extended cameo, I guess. Yeah, good good comedic relief. I mean, I don't, well, I'll wait, Ben, and go ahead and finish. No, no, that was pretty much it. Other than I didn't recognize Gilfoyle, but now that you mention it, I'm like, oh, fuck, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't really have any character development. He was just kind of like the straight laced teacher you know like he didn't even really have any comic moments but whatever it was interesting to see well, him. he did his comedy was very dry that was what's great about him it was you know? but i don't know i mean it didn't i didn't hate hate it by any means but i thought that i thought he would have had a bit more are you sure chad it's okay if you do <laughs> well, i'll check in with the algorithm later <laughs> so now we have see folks now we have two algorithms going chad's algorithm to rank the films and chad's hatred algorithm which sometimes is working <laughs> overtime that one's pretty simple uh, <laughs> that one's pretty simple yeah, actually there you go yeah is the person me no then yes i hate them there you go <laughs> <laughs> i like that man so here, here's my here's my take on Far From Home. Um, it's a great movie, and um, you know I'm just a really big Jake Gyllenhaal fan. He's a fantabulous actor, incredibly skilled. Uh, he played the part to a T. I'll sort of start with what Ben said. I'll, I'll echo what Ben said. Like the tee up was long, but once they th- swung or threw the ball or whatever the hell it it was really good like i loved the illusions stacked on top of illusions stacked on top of illusions to the to the point where you didn't know as a viewer you didn't know which way was up sometimes and that was very cool um i liked how it was sort of a band of kind of what was it? X Stark or X Shield employees or both or something like that. It was like it was like it was like I liked that it was a group of disgruntled employees. You know what I mean? Like unappreciated. And it would like cut back to an old movie throwaway with one of the guys getting yelled at. It's just like now I'm an yes. evil guy. Yes, yes, I really like that a lot. Um, as as a Spider Man movie, it really hits all of the points. Like they've managed to stretch out. And keep the whole theme of Peter understanding, learning about, and executing what responsibility is all about through Civil War, uh, Homecoming, Far From Home. And I love how they've done that because that's a huge theme in Spider-Man, you know, because he is a kid. Tom Holland is, I don't know if he seems this way. Or if it's just been so long since I saw the original Sam Raimi's, but he he's he's younger and he's more kid like than Tobey Maguire was. Even though I even though I loved Tobey Maguire's Spider Man. Um, In hindsight, though, I agree with you. Tobey Maguire seems much more of a man than but, Tom Holland. Yeah, does. yeah, like like a like a twenty four year old Peter Parker rather than a sixteen year old yeah. Peter Parker. It's like when they have like a high school show and all of the high school kids have like beards and shit, you know. 
they cast like 30 year olds. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it, it hits, it hits all the points of a Spider-Man movie. It's, Tom Holland, like, firstly, the writing is great. You know, they they write the whole awkward teen part of it in there just beautifully, you know. And Tom Holland and all of the other characters play it beautifully. Um, I love what they've done with MJ as a character. Like, yeah, she's, she's awesome. She's she's totally updated for 2019, um, which sometimes just doesn't work in films, and it works beautifully with her. And sh- the actress plays it really great. I can't remember the name her name right now, but um, she does a really great job with it. And also, and they haven't gone super damsel and distressy, exactly. But they also yeah. show you know she's sort of hard uh, hearted on the outside, and then they show her sort of soft side later on in the film, which I really liked a lot. Um. So, you know, it shows like the, the teen awkwardness and, and, you know, the theme of responsibility, all those points are hit really well in these Spider-Man films and in this Spider-Man film. Um, it, it's really great. And of, of Peter having to continually learn how to step up to the plate in, in multiple different ways, you know, but the portrayal of him as a young person is it's really well done and it keeps coming through over and over again throughout the film. And I think that that's great. And I, I, I agree with what one or both of you said that I like how he sort of inherited the keys to the kingdom from Tony Stark. And yes, I love that happy is in the movies. I, I, I'm a huge Favreau fan. I have been forever since Rudy. So Uh, I love that Favreau is in it. I, who doesn't love Marissa Tomei? She's great. And I love that her role was expanded in this film as well, because she's a great actress and deserves it. Yeah, well, you know, the Peter Tingle thing is too funny. Yeah, the Peter Tingle thing was so great. <laughs> it's really good. And his buddy Ned is really funny. You know, it's 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 a great, you know, the great blend of comedy is there. And it's also, it's light. The whole film is very, it has that lighthearted tone at times, which is very Spider-Man-ish. And it's great, you know? I, I think if there's any thing that's not spider man about these Tom Holland Spider-Mans is the wisecracking is not exactly there. You know, the the wisecracking Spider-Man, he's always making quips, he's always saying things. Like, they nailed it in Spider-Verse, but not so much in these films. I think you'll probably agree with me. In fact, you will agree with me. Like, not enough, or they didn't hit the right note? No, it's it's almost non-existent. It's almost non-existent. Yeah, right. Because he's 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 playing the awkwardness and the fact that he's a teen, and and maybe he just he hasn't gotten there yet, and and that's a perfectly fine choice that he hasn't gotten the confidence yet where he can do that. But that's the way they're doing it right now, and it's just the only thing missing. I'm just pointing it out. It's not like some world-ending. I hate this movie kind of thing. No, no, no. I guess in a way, like you. Like if if we were all sitting around the table, Kevin Feige style, with all the various creators trying to weave everything together, you could imagine someone making the argument that making Spider Man a wise ass and lining him up to take over Iron Man's position would be a little bit too much of a like for like because of how much of a wise ass Tony was. But I don't know how much I buy that, you know. Yeah. Well, it's a it depends on how closely they want to follow the comics, you know. Um, I feel like in in um civil war during all those you know like sort of uh infighting scenes mm-hmm. there was a, there was there was he was throwing quite a bit out there you know like he was you're right ben spider-man was you know yeah the, the his character was was definitely like you know maybe not quipping but like commenting you know and sort of just saying funny things in the midst of a fight or like even going so far as to like apologize or you know or to mention that like or to or to like have like a fanboy moment kind of a thing, you know, like, so uh, I feel like it was pretty strong there, but they've like dialed it back for uh, the other stuff, you know. He, he was kind of the punchline as opposed to the, the the smack talker. You know, he'd be self-deprecating or apologizing or something silly would happen or he'd be, like you said, fanboying or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like they, they just had to go in that direction with it as opposed to, you know, like Schwarzenegger one-liner kind of, you know. Quips, yeah, no, like, it's not yeah. Arnold puns. Yeah, Chewy. Yeah. I, sp- I suppose the problem of uh, <laughs> that was funny there, Damon. Spidey. I suppose the problem with having uh, Spider-Man being the punchline in the ensemble movies is that you can't really have him be the punchline of his own movie. It, it would take away from 
the movie, I think. So, like, who is he a punchline to? The audience, you know, he's not going to be a punchline to his friends. So, maybe that's why it was missing. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> All right, so anyways, fuck that movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I, I don't know if this is a good transition point or not, but... Going back to the 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 concept I was talking about a minute ago of having the two scripts side by side with none of the you know choices made on on how to get the thing done. Like I think at its core, Spider Man Far From Home's strength was Peter Parker's youth vulnerability and like being a teen a teenager and them really like focusing on his growth as a as a kid. And then it kind of stopped there where Spider-Verse had the same kind of elements. I guess they had the benefit of it being somewhat of an origin as well, so they could even push for, further into it of him being a fish out of water. But then they had, um, you know, the multiverse stuff. So it was like fish out of water, kid learning the ropes, and then you get five different perspectives of, you know, the five other spider people to really kind of flesh it out and then throw a traditional... Um, a, a traditional superhero villain kind of culmination action sequency stuff on top and then layer on some fantastic animation and uh, you really get a home run versus just kind of like a base hit. I, f- I feel like Spider-Verse has a really satisfying character arc for Miles Morales. Yeah. Um, you know, like it's, it's very like all within one movie you're getting like a really solid arc. Whereas I feel like in the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies, it's like a, it's like, they're threading it through the movies in, in sort of a slow progression, which I think is great. Um, and I, I like that they're taking the time to let him be a kid still, you know, and have, have the concerns of being a teen, you know, and, and, and making that a, a part of it. But there's something that, you know, it's like you're, you're getting your, your arc satisfaction from other things that are happening. Not, you know, you're just on the, you're still on the journey with, with Peter Parker. Whereas I feel like in Spider-Verse, you're getting a very solid, you know, you're getting like a nice closure on the on the arc of his of his personality, his his character progression. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And not being able to use his powers and having to kind of find himself, which a lot of the other Spider Man movies, Spider Man movies, and Spider Man reboots to memory, if memory serves, he kind of gets bitten by a spider. Goes, oh my god, this is so weird, and then all of a sudden he's like saving the universe, versus like really struggling to kind of capture the powers, you know. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I'm so tired of origin stories. I know I complained about this in another episode, but we all I mean, have. E- we all have. Even in Spider Verse, <laughs> absolutely, man, and I that's mean, the beauty of Spider Verse is we're, we're all so sick of fucking origin stories, and yet it's like this was like, oh god, yeah, this is amazing. Yeah, and it's five origin stories. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> I know, I know. I think. I mean, I think they were sort of taking the piss out of it, but which is what, probably why I, it was great, but. Which is probably why it was great, but I was still kind of like, okay, all right, we really okay. <laughs> I'll donate five minutes of my life to this. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was really like, you know, I was pretty gobsmacked to use an old school, fantastic Irish term. Yes, good one. Uh, with Spider Verse, I, I didn't really pay attention to it when it came out. I heard it was amazing. I just didn't have time at the time. I think same here. I think my kid had just been born or something. So. It was a good year until I watched it, and I uh, was able to, you know, get like a Blu-ray uh, of it, and it was super high quality. And goddamn, it just absolutely blew me away. Just absolutely floored Popped. me. Yeah, same here. Yeah, the first time I went into it, I went into it thankfully with zero expectations. I had no idea. I had a like a vague idea of, you know, I'd seen some like photos or something, you know, some some artwork. Um, so yeah, it was it was beautifully uh surprising and and delighting the whole way through the first time and i have to say the second time was like every bit as good yes yeah, it didn't lose a thing um i noticed a couple you know little extra things in it and I, it was delightful yeah it was just it was really good really really good i it was such utter eye candy it was it was a great example of you know just pure artistic style in terms of the visuals like they blended computer animation with old school blams and pows and whammos and old school animation and and the bend I mean, dots, the little dots all over the place, the printing dots. 
Yeah, and the sort of the the hash lines and and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was really cool. It just it, it, it's it's just a true piece of art, man. That's what's so great about it. I mean, the soundtrack is great. The music was just perfect, man. You know, it was great. You got some great hip hop stuff in there, and then some just great cinematic stuff. And you know, I mean. You know me, the cast. I'm always about the cast. The cast was incredible, man. Like, leave Schreiber as Fisk. You know, you had Jorma Tacone playing um, one of the Spider-Mans. Chris Pine played the original blonde Spider-Man. Uh, Catherine Hahn. Catherine Hahn, who has been in a ton of movies like, um, what was it, Bad Moms? Bad Moms Christmas? She's really funny, underrated. She's really great. She played um, Olivia Octavius. I love that Doc Ock was a woman. That was great. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, kind of surprised me when it happened. I was like, oh, wow, cool. I didn't see that coming at all. And I thought Aunt May was, uh, Lily Tomlin was great as Aunt May. Um, Mahershala Ali. The guy has won two Academy Awards in like three years. One for Best Supporting Actor, one for Best Actor. And that guy is on fire right now and he's a fantastic actor he just did season three of true detective he did you know moonlight and green book and he's great and he played the uncle who was the prowler you know and he was fantastic man you know like the 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 quality of the performances matched with the animation the sorry the quality of the voice performances matched with the animation really came through in the sense that I was drawn in and I was reacting emotionally to the scenes, man. Like the scene when he's talking to his nephew and he's like, Hey, did you throw that up yet? And he's like, come on, I got a spot, you know, like it was great, man. That was was such a a cool opener. Yeah. A couple of touching moments at the end where I was like, you know, getting a little bit misty because I was really feeling it, man. Cause the actors did a really good job with it. So, yeah. Um, that's my sort of summary nerd love. Yeah, even the even the death of Spider Man in that universe was was like yeah emotional, you know. Oh um, man, yeah, good point, yeah. Ben. Yeah, yeah, really well done. But they did they they jammed so much, like so many little arcs are in that movie, and they did so, they handled it so well. They spent like just the right amount of attention and time on each thing to like. To make it resonate, you know, um, and, and maybe it was like, you know, it has something to do with the animation style or, you know, the direct, it, it was just, they handled it so well. Um, you know, nothing was out of, like, there's, I didn't feel like there was any unresolved arc or like anything was out of place, you know? Or they spent too much time on X and too little time on Y. Yeah, I agree with right. you. Right. Yeah. Like everything, everything about it, like, like I felt pretty satisfied with all of it, you know? So, Yeah. Was it they set up the whole his hunk his uncle you know who turns out to be uh, the what was the character's name Prowler, I forget I think. the Prowler yeah yeah like that that whole thing they spent just enough time on it to make it resonate and you know it was like so efficient it was just and it like, did it really did yeah 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 I even liked um I really enjoyed that they took they went the extra mile for the villain's motivation I thought the I thought Kingpin's family seeing him for what he was and running away and getting in a car crash. Like I thought that was quite powerful and like really good motivation for why he would do what he did versus so many other movies. The villains just like, I want to take over the world. And it's just like, okay, whatever, you know, even, even his arc was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, And to the, to the point where like the villains arc comes to a close in the climactic final battle where like towards the end of the final battle, He's about to, you know, attempt to kill Miles Morales as Spider-Man and his family kind of like comes in again and flashbacks again and gives him that hesitation and the opening, you know, like it just it's not often that the villain gets gets treated as a human or as a as a, a fully fleshed out person and not just a two dimensional kind of punching bag. Sure. Yeah. Doing the wrong thing for the right reasons. Kind of. You don't see that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's usually just, you know, chalked up to, oh, well, they're a sociopath or, they're, you know, it's megalomania or, you know, that kind of a thing, which is kind of exhausting and not, you Well, know. it's just the same thing over and over with all these movies. And I guess you could say the same thing about, um, you know, having five or six different spider people, 
you know, obviously the sixth one is the Peter Parker in Miles' universe that dies in the first few minutes or whatever. Um, you got like, you know, chubby old man Parker showing, you know, the, the kind of fallen hero, you know, kind of the Tony Stark alcoholic fallen hero needing to pick himself up by his bootstraps, you know? So you got like the full spectrum of, of characters that have their own little arcs, not to mention how they handled, um, you know, each, each of the spider people had a, a specific death in their universe that was different than just all of them being the uncle Ben death, you know, like it just gave so much opportunity to, to try different things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the, I, I, I might be wrong here, but I, I think like the, uh, the Gwen Stacy version of Spider-Man or Spider-Woman, whatever they call that version, uh, it was Peter Parker. She, she like, isn't able to like, I think in, in the, the main canon, Spider-Man can't save Gwen Stacy. He tries to, and, and she dies. And I think that happens in the, uh, the second, uh, version of the movies. Um, and that's sort of like another, you know, driving factor besides uncle Ben. But, um, but in, but in her universe, she can't save Peter Parker. So I thought that was like a, a cool twist. Yeah, totally. Very cool twist. Yeah, for sure. I've never really read any of the spider woman stuff and I'm not sure whether that's taken from any of the actual issues, but definitely it was a cool twist. I think it is. It's all, it's all pretty canon stuff. Um, all, all of the, uh, incarnations, including spider ham, which I think we need to talk about for a minute because Kev was talking about the amazing cast and, uh, you know, I got to throw a little shout out to uh, uh, Nick Cage, John, no, John Mulaney. Oh, sorry. As uh, Spider Ham, outstanding. Yeah, he was awesome, man. I I kind of understand why he didn't get more screen time, but I I want more screen time. I, well, there's definitely uh, there's definitely I think there could very well be a sequel because at the very end of it, Miles is like chilling out in his bed with his headphones on, and you see like the multiverse, you know, color splatters come over, and you hear. You hear Gwen Stacy be like, hey, hey, Miles, what's up? You know, so there, there could very well be something. Yeah, I thought I thought uh, like John Mulaney was just perfect for Spider-Ham. <laughs> it just did such a good job. Yeah, dude, Spider-Ham was so funny. What's Is Spider-Ham from something other than the Spider-Pig Simpsons reference? It must be. No, yeah, it's its own, it's its own thing. Um, I don't think there was ever like a... Uh, I know, like, the Spider-Verse thing is was actually a thing in the comic books at once, and there was sort of like a, you know, they did this, like, kind of pan, you know, universal thing with, like, all these different spider, you know. There's always been, you know, like, like My- Miles Morales is, 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 like, you know, whatever Earth number he's from, he actually exists as Spider-Man, you know. So there's, like, all of that. And Spider-Ham was, like, an extreme Peter Porker, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, he was he was like another offshoot of that whole thing. Not that I think they didn't spend like a lot of time on it, but it was like definitely a section in one of those stories. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Chime in, Kev. This is the time in the show for Chad to take a piss, and I haven't heard from you in like half an hour. Boom, boom, boom. It's time for Kev this is to the chime time in. That Ke- <laughs> <laughs> this is the time where Chad takes a leak. This is the time on the show where Chad takes a leak. Uh, Let me chime in here on the Spider-Verse thing. The Spider-Verse thing started, I think it was 2014, 2015, and that's where we got Gwen Stacy as Spider-Woman and um, all these other various characters. Peter Porker as the Spider-Ham, that's been around for a while as like a, a sort of a joke comic right i i remember seeing that years and years ago didn't you ben i i just i i know it's been like an aside and in, in different things um i don't know if it's ever been a comic of its own but i know it's always sort of been yeah like you said it's like a so it's sort of been like a joke that's that's happened like in the midst of other things but i don't know i can't i can't remember you know like part of me wants to say it's like it's like the uh you know it's like a story within a story it's like the pirate but the pirate story and the Watchmen, you know, like the, uh, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like maybe like that kind of a thing. I don't know. We should look, we should have our uh, intern look that up for us. Jimmy, Jimmy, the <laughs> intern. Facts straight. Oh, we should have our intern look that. Oh, you know what, guys? You know what, Ben? Now I remember everything about Peter Porker. Uh, that was a, it was, it started as a one shot. 
in uh, Marvel Tales, starring Peter Porker, the spectacular Spider Ham, November eighty three. So I knew that it was old, and it turned into a bi monthly Peter Porker, the spectacular Spider Ham, under uh, Marvel's banner, Star Comics, and <laughs> the character exists <laughs> on Earth eight three one one which was a universe populated by anthropomorphic animal versions of the Marvel superheroes. And a really funny coincidence here that my recalling of this is exactly um, very similar, almost to the letter of what's written in Wikipedia. That's completely non-coincidental. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Who needs Google when you got to recall a, a memory like that? Yeah, that's just, that's just the broad strokes of Peter Porker. I know. Thank you, guys. It's almost like as if you're a cyborg, Kev. Uh, I am. Hey, uh, hey, Jimmy, Jimmy. <laughs> you're Jimmy, fired. you're fired. Okay, <laughs> Jimmy, you're fired. So anyway, that that that's where Spider Ham came from, and I, you know, it was one of those things. Like when when that came out in the '80s, I do remember that, and I just kind of rolled my eyes because I was I was so into superheroes. I didn't want to see some spoofy. Sp- Spider Man as a pig thing. I just thought it was dumb. Like in, obviously now that I'm an adult, like including it in the Spider Verse was really great. You know, what? Come on, dude. You and I, I you think didn't, it's you didn't read Howard the Duck. <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> I think that uh, you know Spider Ham. You know, I can appreciate the humor of it now. So I think it was actually especially cool that they included Peter Porker as the spider ham in this film, I think it was like, it, it needed to happen, you know, like it, it's been around for a while and there are people that are totally into spider ham. So I thought it was great. And then you throw Penny Parker in there with the, her lovable robot. That was quite hilarious too. Like I think Peter Porker and Penny Parker were just two great additions to round out the team. Because obviously you got you got like noir being a bit more of a, a, a you know a dark horse, and then the the kind of more traditional, you know what you would imagine kind of roles, and then you just throw in the two wild cards, and it just really makes it sing. Is is Penny Parker? Is that whole? Is that like an offshoot of Spider Man? I don't know. Like the Japanese, the Japanese Spider Man thing. Kev, do you have any? Um, do you have any like fantastic re- recall in regards to Penny Parker? Well, the the way it's billed in the credits is uh, Penny Parker as Spider, spelled S P forward slash forward slash D R. Okay. So, <laughs> whatever, whatever that means, <laughs> I don't know. Bit elite speak. Where was Supida Man from? It, it it's look it, it's it's all of these characters come from what I I was talking to Ben. Uh, what I was saying to Ben a second ago, Chad, is that all these characters come from the whole Spider-Verse storyline that started in the comics. And that started in, I think, 2014. It was 2014, 2015. So she was yet another character in the Spider-Verse gotcha. uh, around that time. And that's where she came from or was invented or the genesis of her character came from that. Jesus. We got there in the end. Anyway, I, I just I thought the choices were cool. I I've never seen these Spider Verse characters before, and um, as I don't really have time to read comics, even if I did want to, and I really liked um, I liked Penny. That was a very interesting take on um, a, an alternate universe version of Spider Man. So you've got the little girl who shares a telepathic uh, connection with a radioactive spider, and she. And that radioactive spider pilot this spider bot. I mean, like, how cool is that? And it's totally anime, too. But the best bit about it isn't, it's not just like, oh, yeah, they share a telepathic connection. It's they share a telepathic connection and they're best friends. <laughs> just like, oh. <laughs> oh, of course. Right. Sorry, it's Chad. so funny. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot to throw in that crucial piece. Yeah. Best friends with a fucking spider. Like, yeah, that's, yeah, okay. Oh, it's so funny. Yeah, the robots like facial expressions and shit were just so classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What else? I think I really liked um I really liked Old Man Parker. I thought him as the mentor, as the kind of Obi-Wan kind of thing was was great cuz he just kind of doesn't give a shit 
and like the kind of intro with him once he like the opening scene where he's passed out and just like flopping all over New York was quite silly but funny and well handled and then he wakes up and they're just kind of like walking all over the sides of buildings arguing about whether they're going to help each other or not I thought it was just really really added a lot to it yeah I think I think he was meant to be like our Spider-Man yeah probably who yeah who was the you know the 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 Obi-Wan Spider-Man the that you know the the dark-haired Peter Parker not the one that died in in uh, Miles Morales's universe but the so was I, if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was meant to be like, you know, whatever number our Earth is. Uh, he was supposed to be our Spider-Man. Just, uh, but, you know. Also probably a surrogate for us. He will learn patience. <laughs> Yaki Soba. <laughs> I went to um, an unnamed warehouse grocery store recently in in the frozen food section they had a item called yakisoba and of course i thought of my old friend there he goes and yakisoba <laughs> plocoon baby try some yakisoba that's it <laughs> plocoon baby try some yakisoba What's that from? Uh, we're diving a little too deep into the n- <laughs> nerd quantum inception Nerdy. reality. Sorry, Chad. Yeah. If we're back in the quantum realm, maybe we can fix my fucking algorithm. Dude, that's <laughs> going to take some crazy shit. You might need some, some uh, yeah, you might need uh, some superposition to... Uh, Reboot the mainframe. To figure out your, your yeah, the numbers are going to start getting too entangled and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna just disappear in a nerd singularity. Yeah, well, you're just you're just not gonna a have nerdularity. You're, just, you're not gonna have any numbers. Like it's just all gonna be caught up. <laughs> we'll just go to your letter letter it's rating. Gonna, just gonna be it's gonna be up in the air, you know. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> Broadcasting live from inside the nerdularity. <laughs> wow, we really fell off the rails, guys. Yaki soba. Yeah, we did fall every time. Little bit. It's, it's part. Of, it's part. It was, it was actually completely my fault. Well, I want to know what this yaki soba bullshit is. All right, Ben, favor him with the story, and so we can move on. I never should have brought that up. I love you're like just, <clears throat> just tell him. Oh God damn it! It's actually Jarhigo's fault for bringing up Obi Wan. There, I said it. Okay, ahead, well, <laughs> no, it was actually Chad that brought up Obi Wan. Yeah, I brought um, up Obi Wan, so that's yeah. my death. Sorry, it was Chad's fault yeah. for bringing up Obi Wan. There, I said it. And here's where I die. Fine, I nobody's really going to understand this, but um. So <laughs> the the original Xbox, there was a game called Obi Wan, um, which is sort of like a third person, you know, uh, you know, platformy kind of, you know, uh, you know, you know, game. When you beat the game, it opens up an arena where you can play as any number of of like you know characters. So you can be, uh, you know, you can be like. Obi-Wan, or you can be uh, Mace Windu, or you can be, you know, I think you can even be Luke Skywalker. Um, but, you know, one of the Jedi is just Plo Koon, and he's this guy with the sort of orange, he's like an alien, very alien looking Jedi. He sort of has like an orangey sort of head, like fleshy head. But he has like this weird like mask, like a black breathing mask kind of a thing. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know, I know you nerds out there other than us know who Plo Koon is. But, um, Anyways, totally those nerds know the the whole idea. The whole idea was that, you know, Obi-Wan and Plo Koon were. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. OK, so <laughs> Plo Koon, if you don't die at the end of this, Ben, I'm going to be amazed. No, I already, I already, I already, I'm already dead. I'm already dead. <laughs> so Plo Koon in this game, if you played him, it sounded like like all the characters had like a catchphrase that they would sort of repeat over and over again when you would do like special attacks. So Plo Koon's character would say something that sounded like, like you couldn't really tell what he was saying because he has a mask on his mouth and he talks like this, you know? So it sounded like, I'll violate you like a lamb chop. Oh, I'll that's violate a, you like a lamb chop. I was trying chop. to find that. I'll violate you like a lamb chop. <laughs> <laughs> I used to love it. That's what it sounded like. And there you have it, folks. I'll violate you like a lamb chop. I totally remember talking shit about that. The the joke was that, you know, like that was all that, that uh, Plo Koon subsisted on was lamb chops and you know he's in like a diner with Obi-Wan and Obi-Wan's like 
Come on, Flo, baby. You've got to branch out, man. You've got to branch out. <laughs> yeah, try some Yaki Soba. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and just like, oh my God. Right. Lamb chops. <laughs> you know? It's like, no, try some Yaki Soba. When we did our Star Wars episode, I spent like 20 minutes trying to find that fighting game. I thought it was a fighting game, but it's the unlocked thing at the end of at the end of the uh, of Obi Wan Kenobi yeah. game. The game. You're yeah. thinking of the Force Unleashed or whatever. That's that what I thought. Was. I was trying to figure out what it was. Yeah. But, oh, that's fantastic. I love that. That's totally saying in the yeah. show. So, so there you go, folks out there listening. There's some inside info that you probably never needed to know, and now back to the show. I, I'm dead. <laughs> well, it doesn't have anything to do with Spider-Man, but it has everything to do with an episode of our show. Um, so w- where t- is there a way to get us back on the rails, or do we not have a crane that large? Are we now just eating lamb chops at a diner with a dude in a mask? <laughs> yaki soba, baby. <laughs> yaki soba. Yaki soba. Hello, try some yaki soba. Was that the uh, was that the game where you would run around as Obi Wan and whenever you pushed a button he would just say I'm not sure over and over again? Yes, yes, yeah, I remember yes. that game. I'm, yes. I'm, not, I'm sure. not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how we get the fucking show back on track. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think uh, talking about the use of multiverse was interesting. Do we go back up to high level, or are we still like talking about the nitty gritty, like funny individual bits? No, I mean, look, I, I, I think the the I, I've always been into that sort of stuff. I, I mean, I mean, of course, having studied quantum physics, <laughs> I mean, sorry, <laughs> having a PhD in quantum <laughs> physics, I'm always interested in multiple universes. Chad, having having an honorary degree from New England Technical Institute. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> I like how you said New England Tech. Um, New England Technical Having Institute an honorary an NIT. degree. Sorry, from NIT. Um, so anyway, having an honor- honorary degree from NIT in uh, quantum physics, I'm always interested in the idea of multiple universes or parallel worlds, as I like to call them sometimes. So um, I, I really dig that. I have always liked that... Uh, I don't know what's the word. What what are the words I'm I'm looking for here? MacGuffin? No, I don't. That's not a MacGuffin. I mean, maybe it's a MacGuffin, but I've always liked that uh, use of that in stories, in comic book stories, and in science fiction stories. So, um, seeing it in in you know the Spider Verse was great, and I and I was glad to find out upon reading later that this all started in the comics. You know. I mean, it's a very tricky thing. Like, you can use parallel worlds, you know, alternate universes to sort of bring characters back and explain away a lot of stuff. And and in that sense, I and I've seen that done before in comics, and I haven't always loved it. But I think when it's done right, you know, it's really great. I mean, that's sort of a stupid thing to say because anything when done right is great. But uh, they did a really good job of bringing in those characters from the multiple universes here. And it was an interesting and varied group of characters from an interesting and varied group of multiverses or parallel universes or parallel worlds or whatever you want to call them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I, I really dug that. I thought that that was really good. Yeah, I kind of like, I feel the same way. And and they even kind of touched on the multiverse thing in Far From Home. Um, I don't know if now's the time to talk about the post credit stuff in Far From Home, but I had a bit of a, I don't know, kind of like a gripe about the kind of direction that they seem to be going. No, I'm, that's a good segue. I mean, we're terrible at segues anyway, so just, yeah. Go for it, man. <laughs> I just think, like, like I don't have, like, super fully formed thoughts on this, and I also don't want to ramble for half an hour, but, like, I found in the last few years with whatever it is I'm reading or watching or whatever, I ha- I'm, ha- I'm finding it really difficult to find entertainment, like, whatever form, books or whatever, that really, like, I really like, I really love, you know, like, to be like, oh, that was pretty good or that was pretty good or whatever, you know, I, come, 
I'm becoming a bit of a salty curmudgeon in my old age with just like wanting great stuff and not wanting to put up with not so great stuff. And one of the one of the things that seems to be happening over and over again from my perspective is like there just doesn't seem to be a lot of new stories. A lot of people seem to be just like regurgitating or recycling the same old tropes, you know? Yeah, I agree. And um, like one of the most Real- common, like, sorry, what? I was just going to say we're also older and wiser now, but go ahead. Yeah, it's a fair point. It is a fair point. But at the same time, like, there's some super obvious um, examples of, like, you know, so many things nowadays have, like, fucking vomit zombies. You know, it's like, can't just make a a new sci-fi show. It has to have zombies in it or alien whatever zombies. Or, like, um, I had it written down. Just give me two seconds. Oh, like... I can't actually remember any of the things I was mentioning that I hated, folks, but they're there. Um... I can't remember them. No, I just said uh, <laughs> the other thing. The other most common one is that ties in with this is is um, aliens. So like it seems like any universe that gets created these days, they just like make a bunch of stories and eventually they run out of material. And then it's like, all right, how about aliens invade or how about vomit zombies come in? And the the, the post credit stuff in Far From Home, the second post credit scene where Nick Cage is in the holodeck somewhere Fury. and there's the two Cree or Fury. whatever. Fury, yeah. <laughs> uh, Nick Fury, sorry. Nick Cage. That'd be pretty sick. Um, in Spider-Man Far From Home, folks, Nick Nick Fury is played by Nick Cage. Yeah. Spider-Man, you didn't read the uh, the fan theory that Nick Cage is actually Nick Fury? They're fi- they fired Sammy Jackson. That's why he's on the holodeck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my um, God. Wow. I think I died a second time. The uh, Wow, you just did two deaths in one show? Is this some kind of like epic thing? The the Kree bullshit, like, I don't know, the the Kree in Captain Marvel, I was kind of like, yeah, okay, cool, whatever. I, you know, listen to Captain Marvel episode if you want more details on the ups and downs of that, but it could have been handled in a different way and it could have been more entertaining. I just don't, number one, I, I'm i I'm tired of post credit scenes. They just need to go away. And number two, agree. this post credit scene, you know, insinuating that, the aliens are going to have a huge part in the MCU. I'm not super stoked about like, I'd rather the multiverse stuff be a focus than all of a sudden the MCU is the entire universe. Like I, I, I enjoy that guardians of the galaxy is alien focused, but is a periphery is it's on the periphery of the MCU. Like it's its own thing. Sure. I don't, yeah. I don't see the value in the entire MCU going super multi species multi universe like all you know like it just it doesn't interest me as much as like a multiverse style broadening of the MCU interests me and so like the Spider-Man Spider-Verse multiverse stuff is far more interesting to me than than you know going the alien route if that makes sense that was a really meandering ramble but I hope I get the point across well but Chad the alien thing has always been a a pretty like meaty part of the MCU. I mean, you know, if you look at a series like uh, Fantastic Four, for instance, you know, yeah, that's true. You, you've got like, you know, yeah, there's a lot of crazy alien shit going on in that, and maybe what they're. I mean, one of the things uh, that I've heard is is that some of this stuff is setting up for uh, a reboot of the Fantastic Four, an MCU reboot of the Fantastic Four. So yeah, they have the rights. Because Disney bought um, 20th Century Fox's properties and Marvel, they now own everything. So this wasn't anything unusual for the MCU. Aliens are actually a pretty large part of the MCU, and they always have been. It just depends on what, I guess, what comic you're reading and what perspective you're looking at it from. Because, you know, if you're looking at it from, like, Spider-Man's perspective, say, you know, you're not seeing Spider-Man encounter a lot of aliens if you're looking at like the fantastic four or the guardians of the galaxy or you know any other number of uh, comics out there then yes they they are um it just depends yeah absolutely as a kid i was not interested in seeing aliens in comic books period so anything that had to do with aliens i just steered away from it like fantastic four and all these other things when i got back into comics in my 20s i was way more open to it and i i would read just about anything but for some strange reason, when I was a kid, those two things just had to be separate. So, yeah. like, aliens were for movies like 
aliens <laughs> and you know whatever else and um i see i just died right there again because nobody got my little <laughs> reference joke anyway I, um, liked it. <laughs> I i i thought yeah you're laughing now <laughs> you're laughing at my death not my joke so um but ben's right all that stuff has been there forever so i think it's cool that they're incorporating it into the mcu um, is that the next direction they're hinting at going in the MCU? Yes. And if so, I don't know if I'm into it either. I don't yeah. know. I mean, I'm sure we'll watch the 25 movies that it takes to tell the next story, but. And, and we'll do podcasts about them. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, we'll just have to see, won't we? Well, in, uh, in traditional going way too deep in, in a direction, um, from what I understand, I think. Back in the day, one of my uh, one of my exes was in the hospital with Lyme disease, getting um, intravenous antibiotics, and we were sitting there like we had to sit there for an hour while she got antibiotics. And there was a nurse in the room, and he was this like kind of tubby, tubby nurse who started talking about Star Wars. And I was just like, oh yeah, you know, I like Star Wars, whatever. And he's like, oh, have you read all the books? And it turns out this dude like read all. 500 of the extended universe books and i i read a bunch oh of them when i was like God. 13 years old or whatever and i was like oh I, I read a few of those uh i read up until you know blah 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 and i was like what what did they end up doing with all that stuff and he's like oh well you know chewbacca dies because someone drops a fucking planet on him and i was like oh that's heavy shit no way and then they're like and then aliens came in and i was like what and so, like, evidently, like, 500 books into the series, they ran out of shit to talk about, so they just brought in an entire alien race to, like, take over the galaxy. And it's just, like, it feels kind of like that, you know, where it's just, like, you run out of things to talk about, and then you just, like, pull in a random MacGuffin mm -hmm. that everyone has to rally around. You know, everyone has to join together to rally, rally the troops and fight against this random thing that's going to kill everybody. And now we're all brothers and sisters. And it's just, yeah, like, right, right. I'm not overly interested in that i guess like i prefer stories that are like the struggles between you know humans as a you know like the hum the human struggle as opposed to humans struggling against some unknown you know i guess it's less relatable but i don't know yeah well i mean it's not even a new trope for the movies it's it's just, it's just more of the same yeah you know <clears throat> it's just like they're i don't know it looks like they're moving to expand things out to the universe at large as opposed to focusing on what's happening on Earth. Which, as I said, like, Guardians, man, I really love Guardians. I love the little niche that they've carved out. I just don't think it should be the front and center, everyone, you know, orbiting Guardians. I love Guardians as its own periphery, you know, plot thing and if captain marvel 2 is you know set in space during the time she's gone like also fine but i love the you know i love the avengers style saving earth on earth with humanity and its foibles and kind of like all of the factions fighting against each other and you know even like the un you know law or whatever it was that prevented the avengers from doing their shit like i just prefer that kind of stuff i guess and i hope they don't veer too far away from it and I, the post credit stuff with far from home made, made me worry about that yeah i i get that i'm with you man i'm not nuts about the whole alien thing but you know whatever we'll, we'll see what happens i'm interested to see what happens and I'm interested to see if it holds my interest. Do you guys have any comments on the like comment of I'm sick of post credit scenes? Uh I before when you said it before, I just said I agree. I'm I'm kind of done with them. Like I mean the novelty of them has worn off. Like it it was a great device in the beginning because it was like, you know, superhero films were new. You know, this sort of goes back to hero fatigue. Like the, the films were new and, you know, they threw these little nuggets in and you're like, oh my God, it's a little mini teaser in the middle of the credits for the next possible movie. Oh my God. Let's go talk about it on our podcast. Yeah. But <laughs> now that we've done 23 <laughs> films plus every other superhero film, because now uh, everybody uh, does them, it's, yeah, they're tired, man. And I, I think it's like time to go in another direction, like just not do them anymore. And in this particular case, I feel like it took it like legitimately took some of the goodness out of Far From Home. Like it took what was a good movie and then was just like, hey, you know, the whole thing with 
Nick Fury and his sidekick. Yeah, they're aliens. And it's just like fuck. Can it not yeah. just be? It's it, can it not just be the movie I watched? Do you have to like? I know. Fucking change the last two hours of the movie I just watched because of clever bullshit. Well, it's because that's the way they market the films now, dude. This is part. This is marketing combined with filmmaking. Yeah. I mean, this is what it is, dude. You know, it's foreshadowing, bro. I just don't fucking care. There's something cheap about that whole that whole thing. The whole thing with where they it is yeah. cheap. That's a good choice of words. I, I didn't. I didn't like that. Look, Ben. Before it was working and it was novel and it was cool. Now it's exactly what you just said. It's like cheap. It's cheap, yeah. right? It's yeah. It's like it is okay, folks. Now we're gonna pull the curtain back and show you what was really going on the whole time. You know, like scrolls. It's just like stupid and unnecessary, and and you know, it's a, it's a cheap, cheap thing. What I did like about the post credit things is seeing J.K. Simmons yet again as J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> oh my god, that was the best part of the whole thing. That was sick. Which. Which totally could lead to the multiverse thing. Like, I think that the, yeah. <laughs> they have, like, maybe there's a multiverse, and in every multiverse there's J. Jonah Jameson, and in this one he happens to be Alex Jones. Like, that's – it really could be an awesome segue into pulling multiverse stuff in and how, like, I saw somebody talking about how, you know, they could pull Miles Morales from Spider-Verse as a cameo in a future movie. You know, like – I'd be way more interested in that than the alien bullshit. So you have like that's that's definitely that's definitely in the canon as a the theory that Miles Morales is going to show up. Yeah, which I think it's great. I like, but you've got like two dueling post credit scenes. One post credit scene is like pushing the multiverse agenda, and the other one's pushing the aliens take over the universe agenda. And I just, uh, yeah, I definitely know which one I prefer. Wait a second. Wait. Alex Jones as J. Jonah James, J. 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 James. Wait, what? No, the the scene where he he's kind of acting like a right wing news dude. You know, like they're making the or, Daily or, or, Bugle or whatever. The more specifically, is. like a conspiracy news yeah. dude. Oh, yeah. oh, oh! I got you. They're yeah. kind of like okay. they're, they're, they're which framing, is clever. It's clever. They're framing J. Jonah Jameson to be like a conspiracy, you know, troll kind of. Uh, Troll, yeah, sort of Nut. news guy. Yeah. Whereas okay. you know he's been different in other things. But yeah, wouldn't it be funny if the like the constant in every <laughs> every multiverse every is universe him, is yeah? J. Jonah Jameson looks like J.K. Simmons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be amazing. <laughs> yes, totally, dude. Anyways. It's like he's almost like the new Stan Lee cameo. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Totally. I do. I do. Kind of feel like. You know, Benny, your comment about wanting to really deep dive on Spider Verse it makes a lot of sense. So I, I feel like Spider Verse is a great candidate for whenever we do our first deep dive. I think it's going to be a, a big part of it because this is like a a multiple viewing movie if there ever was one. Uh, yeah, I like it. I like that idea. Let's do it. I agree. Let's schedule that, folks. So how did we die this week, uh, ladies? Oh my god! Well, I died three times, but yeah, I'm I died like six fucking times. The, yeah, the one that I in, I think I enjoyed the most was when um, we were talking about aliens in the MCU, and I said that I liked uh, when I was a kid. I, anything that had to do with aliens, I wasn't interested in in superhero comics. I thought that aliens needed to stay in other movies like aliens yeah i like that i just and didn't laugh I it guess. <laughs> was it fell it was like dropping a anvil off of a three million story building and it just landing flat and doing nothing nothing happened nobody laughed that's where i died uh it, it's funny because it, it was funny but like i think you you just like your timing was I think maybe both both of us were like ready to say something at that point, and then we kind of stopped. And instead of laughing, like we, you know, <laughs> we're gonna. We're, yeah. Well, yeah. now I know how Jarhigo <laughs> feels. Anyways. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Whoever's next. I don't even remember. I died a few times. I died quite a few times. Unfortunately, I can't recall. You did. I definitely died though. I just died again. 
I'm going to go with my yammering uh, yakisoba story. Oh, the yakisoba, that was good stuff. There, there, yeah. Wait, is that when you died, Ben? Y- yammering about yakisoba? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I could have definitely been more concise about that. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. Bringing up yakisoba. I think that was actually how I died. I brought Obi Wan up, and that di- di- totally diverted the whole thing. So we both died in that moment, Ben. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, that that was actually the moment that the the entire podcast died because that was where it completely fell off the rails. <laughs> That's it. For such a good cause, though, like that was good. Oh man, you know, and I, I never finished the story about uh, Plo Koon and and uh, finish Obi Wan. Well, so please finish. <laughs> So Obi-Wan's trying to convince Plo Koon, you know. Plo Koon's like, Lamb drops. And Obi-Wan's like, <laughs> But Plo, baby, come on. Live a little. Just try some yakisoba. And finally Plo Koon just breaks down and he's like, Okay. <laughs> and he takes his... <laughs> Obi-Wan pushes the plate in front of him. <laughs> Plo Koon pulls his mask off. And he's just got, like, this disgusting, like, <laughs> mouth that's, like, a mix between, like, tentacles and, like, like mandibles on a fly, on, a, like, a spider or whatever. And, like, the, you know, <laughs> like, the, the predator, you know, just, like, this disgusting mouth. It's just, like, a nightmare of every bad thing you've ever seen a mouth be in any movie. And then he proceeds to, like, vomit on the food <laughs> like a fly would. And then, like, this, like, horrible proboscis comes out of his face and just starts slurping it up. And Obi-Wan's just like... Oh, Plur baby, remind me to never, never try anything in front of me ever again. <laughs> oh, that's fucking classic. Wait, you guys, ne- you guys never even commented on the whole Uba thing. It, uh, I couldn't play it. I hit play, and it they removed the video. Yeah, exactly. Oh, really? Yeah, the video's gone. So I went searching for one, but I couldn't find it. What was it? Oh, uh, it's just you know, like at the end of. Uh, <clears throat> I know the Uba. Yeah, robot the end of Revenge of the Sith. It's just the the robot. This is oh, like you know, dude. <laughs> like Padme is like dying and like crying and she's freaking out about her life. Uba, yeah, and the Uba. stupid, stupid like midwife robot is just like just trying to calm her down by saying, <laughs> Uba, 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 Uba. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, oh, I'm dying. I'm dying. Right. <laughs> and then the robot the robot is like um the robot's like there is no explanation for it. She is perfectly healthy, yet she is dying of a broken heart or something. Yeah. Oh totally my god. George like Lucas, that. eat a bag of dicks. And then Uba. Yeah, and then she's Uba. like Uba. Uba. <laughs> ben and I we Ben, you and I used to Uba like all the time. I remember that. It's, it's so funny, man. <laughs> That was great. Uba, Uba. Uba. I've done that to my kids Uba. to soothe them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, our kids are going to be so fucked up. <laughs> oh, man. All right, dudes. That was, uh, that was some funny shit. Looking forward to Stranger Things. I'll chat to you in a week. So stay tuned for that exciting episode, folks. This is Kev saying so long for now. la di da <laughs> I will see you on another time. See you on another time. That wraps up this week's episode, folks. Violate you like a lamb chop and yaki soba. If you want to find links to the stuff we spoke about today, you can find them in the show notes in your podcast app of choice or at the website ebd.fm forward slash 15. If you have any thoughts on the show or an idea for a topic, hit us up on Twitter at EBD Podcast. You can find me at Mulverine on Twitter. That's M-O-H-L-V-E-R-I-N-E. Chad is at Chad Normal on Twitter. Ben is at Jarhego on Twitter. That's J-A-R-H-E-E-G-O. If you like the show, please recommend us to a friend. And as always, thanks for tuning in, folks. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll be talking about Stranger Things. Ooh. Ooh la la. The upside down. <laughs>